Hey everyone, it's Colin. How's it going? I've got quite the late 90s PC. Let's check it out. This machine was sold under several different names, but the most common one that it was referred to is the Easy Now PC. Obviously, it's a smaller form factor and it's got quite an interesting appearance from the side, but get a load of the front. It's, um, well, let's just say the press decided to call this egg shaped, but it was brought to my attention that it resembles something else. Um, <laughs> let's just get into the specs and then we'll talk about this thing's history. What particular specifications these machine had really came down to where you bought them from. They're what's known in the computing industry as a white box system. Basically, they came from the factory unbranded and they were sold to various resellers that they could then brand themselves. So those resellers had some say in what the specific components inside could be. But in general, what I've found is the majority of these machines came with something like 64 megabytes of RAM, an eight gigabyte hard drive, a 24 speed CD-ROM drive, and then a CPU along the lines of a 450 or 500 megahertz AMD K62. Apparently there were plans at least later on to upgrade that to a K63, but I think even a K62 would kind of be pushing this machine for reasons we'll see in a little bit. In terms of ports and connectivity, there's a pair of USB 1.1 ports on the front, and then this is the latch to open the CD-ROM drive. And around back, we've got modem ports, so this would be what goes to the wall, and then this is a pass-through for your telephone, three more USB ports, analog audio in and out, VGA for your monitor, 10 100 Ethernet, and then a power input socket, because this thing doesn't have a built-in power supply, and this thing has kind of become my nemesis. This machine, when I got it, didn't come with its external AC adapter, so I've got to figure out how I can get this thing powered just to see if it even works and, and use it, show it off for you. What's really frustrating is the way they labeled the back and trying to find information about the power supply requirements for this machine. As you can see, it's got the standard diagram on here for a barrel jack showing that it's center positive and sleeve negative, but they physically put a mini DIN connector on the back. Now I've seen computers and all sorts of other peripherals use this sort of socket before, so it's not completely non-standard. However, the pinout doesn't necessarily really seem to be consistent across different manufacturers. I've found other devices that have used this for single voltage and other devices that have used it for multiple voltages for, let's say, both 12 and 5 volts at the same time. Unfortunately, I also can't find any information specifically about the pinout for this computer. I do know that the machine only requires 12 volt in, but which pins do what? Well, that's the big question. So I guess the next thing that we need to do is take this thing apart. It'll give us a good excuse to look at what's going on inside, but then we can also figure out what kind of pinout this jack needs so we can find or make an appropriate power supply. Looks like there's basically just these three screws in the back. They're standard Phillips head. And they're actually kind of loose, which suggests, well, a story that we've seen time and time again on this channel. I don't think I'm the first person to have taken this machine apart. You can already kind of get an idea as to how the airflow works inside here. There's this fan on the bottom and it seems to be blowing inwards and then this is the CPU cooler and it blows outwards. Did this machine actually have effective cooling? Mm, not so sure about that because that's really kind of the only ventilation and the air exhausting out the CPU side here comes through these, that's what these kind of gills, I guess you could say, on the side of the case are for. And then there's holes in the bottom of the case for air intake. But 
Well, having had a lot of experience with the K6 series CPUs back when they were new in the late 90s, well, I can tell you they ran hot and putting one inside an enclosure this small might not have been the best idea. All right, so here's the inside of the system. The hard drive kind of mounted vertically here. It's really the only space they had for it. I'm gonna go ahead and disconnect it just to get it out of the way. IDE, of course. And looks like this drive is 30 gigs. So this might have been at least one of the reasons why this machine has been taken apart. I don't think that's the original drive. And the optical drive as well is IDE. It's this weird like vertical front mount drive. I don't know how custom that mechanism is. I'm a little worried if it is dead, but anyway, it is on its own IDE channel. That's nice to see. And then here's the rest of the board. Uh, this board uses a form factor called Flex ATX. Apparently that was an Intel standard that they tried to push. Basically, its footprint is just a little bit smaller than micro ATX. Motherboard manufacturers were, of course, free to use chipsets that they wanted and figure out exactly how they wanted to package boards. Flex ATX doesn't necessarily mean it has to be one of these kinds of boards that requires an external power supply and that sort of thing. This motherboard was manufactured by a company called Biostar, and specifically the model of this board is the M5 SAF. Um, I think the board was used in some other machines other than just this Easy Now PC. Maybe like industrial kind of PCs, that sort of thing, or maybe some other inexpensive home PCs. There's not a ton of information about this out there. And a lot of that speaks to the time period from when this thing was sold. It was announced in or around 1998 and launched in late 1999. Why these were all white box systems is because the chassis and the whole kind of architecture of this was actually designed by AMD. And then AMD got so-called partner companies to join in to manufacture and sell it. As far as I can tell, Biostar was the only company that actually manufactured these, but of course they were sold various places around the world. I found a seller in the UK that called this the Ego2 PC, and then a lot of the information that I actually found about this was from some Japanese tech blogs in like the Internet Archive from back then. So clearly some markets liked it more than others, but obviously it was built down to a price. The whole thing was meant to be sold for right around 500 bucks for the computer. And you can kind of tell, right? Only room for one hard drive. It's a CD-ROM drive instead of a burner. It's got an SIS chipset, which handles onboard video and sound. There are no card slots whatsoever in this thing. So you have very limited expandability. There's even only one RAM slot in here. It is a SuperSocket 7 board, so the CPU can be upgraded, but you know, the AMD K6 and you know, 2 and 3 series CPUs, in my experience, they ran quite hot. So packing one of those into a form factor this small, mm, uh, kind of a recipe for disaster if you were to go with some of the faster ones, maybe. Um, you can just tell this thing was built down to a price and tried to integrate as much as possible into it. All right, so what I need to figure out is the polarity of that DC input jack on the back. Like I said, it's a connector that different devices have used over time, but nobody's really come up with a standard for the pinout. And my worry is that if I just grab a power supply and plug it into this thing, if the pins are flipped, it could like fry the motherboard or kill a regulator or something like that on there. Now, that said, it's also possible that someone before me has had this machine and tried it and killed it. So pursuing getting this thing up and running is a little bit of a risk in and of itself. That said, let's give it a shot, right? It wouldn't be much of a video if I just said, oh, I'm too chicken to try and get it working. So anyway. Um, the easiest way to do it is going to be to try and figure out which pins are ground. I know the positive voltage 
for this thing is 12 volts and it seems to only need 12 volts. There are regulators on the board that will create like five volts and I think 3.3 volts as well that this thing needs to function. So if I can figure out which pins are ground, then I know by default that the other pins are going to be for positive voltage. So what I'm gonna do is use the, uh, the hard drive power tail to make things easy and I'm just gonna go negative probe of my multimeter into one of the uh, marked ground leads on this power tail. And then we'll just probe the pins on this socket and see which ones make the meter beep. So let's start with the shield of the connector. That's probably going to be ground. It usually is. And it is. Okay, so that makes sense. Now let's figure out these pins. Um, okay, that one. Why can't I get... I'm not getting very good contact in there because the probe is too big to fit in the in the holes. <laughs> this video is getting a little suggestive, isn't it? Um, so here's the, I anticipated this, here's the cheater trick. I've just got a paper clip that I kind of extended. I also use it for like ejecting SIM trays and stuff on phones. And if we put that in there, then we can touch those two. Okay, so that's nothing. That's nothing. I think we determined this bottom one. Yep, that one's ground. And then what about the one above it? Okay, so that one's ground as well. So we know the two right pins on here are ground and then the two left pins are gonna be positive voltage. Let's see if I've got an AC adapter that'll plug in and work. Okay, so I managed to find two power supplies with the right kind of connector on there. This one is 12 volt, 12.5 amp. So that's a bit beefier than I'm looking for. I think the computer itself only needs like five amps doesn't really draw all that much. So uh, the problem is the pinout thankfully is labeled on this adapter. Unfortunately, it's flipped from what I need. This view is basically the way the pinout is from the connector side as you're looking at the end of it. So in this case, the ground pins are on the right and positive voltage is on the left, but we know on the PC that it's the opposite of what it needs in that socket. So to get this power supply to work, I'd have to kind of hack it, I guess. Thankfully, I found another one that's a little bit more appropriate. This one is 12 volts, but six amps, so it's closer. And I don't feel as bad kind of hacking this power supply to make it work because a 12 amp power supply could be useful for other projects. And it's got a similar connector on the end and I probed it off camera and it's pinned out the same way as that other power supply. So this thing's gonna need a little bit of work in order to plug into the PC, but hopefully this is all we need. So I figured the easiest way to try to get this thing to work because the connector on the end is all molded on, I can't really take it apart and like rewire the connector pins, would be to just cut the cables somewhere in the middle and basically flip the wire. So that's what I did. They're red and white here and I just kind of flipped them and resoldered them back together. Yeah, I know the heat shrink isn't big enough to span the gap. This is really just for testing. And if it worked, I'd go ahead and clean it up. But unfortunately it doesn't work. And there's a really good reason why. It's because of this connector. Since it's molded together, I can't take it apart, but I tested the pinout after doing all the work with the meter. And I found that whenever they put this connector on, they tied the two pins that they originally used for ground to the shell of the connector. So when I rewired this, it basically turned the shell of the connector to positive voltage which is bad because we know the shell on the connector on the PC needs to be grounded. So I can't make this work as is, which is really annoying. So I went back to that original power supply we looked at and my hope was to be able to just disassemble the connector on the end because it does look like it's kind of a more modular design. I figured I'd be able to just resolder the pins, just flip them here and make sure that the shell stayed ground. Uh, that wasn't really going to work. So I ended up having to just completely desolder it. I found that you can buy these connectors. It's basically called Power Mini Din. 
They look like regular DIN connectors, but the pins inside them are actually a bit thicker gauge, just probably for current handling capacity. And soldered a new one onto this wiring with the polarity that I needed. It all tests out, it shows the correct voltage. So, you know, I figured this power supply is gonna be great. And then I plugged it in and tested it out and found the computer didn't want to power on. All right, before we get too deep in the weeds troubleshooting, let's check for simple problems first, like if everything on the motherboard is plugged in correctly. Specifically things like the power switch. Um, looks like it comes through here, goes into a two pin to three pin adapter. Okay, that's different. Um, but it is plugged in, and here's the uh, power LED right next to it. Doesn't matter the polarity because it's just a momentary switch. But what is going on with this? Someone wrapped like electrical tape and scotch tape over the switch. Oh, I think I see why. Because one of the little plastic tabs that holds the switch into this bracket is broken off, so the whole thing... Yeah, see it gets mashed in like that. The power button itself is like spring-loaded, the plastics for it. So if it's not making contact with the actual switch, it still feels like you're pressing the power button. So that's probably what was faking me out. I thought I was actually hitting the switch, but this thing was just getting mashed inside and not actually actuating. Now, am I going to hold this in here? I'm going to cheat. See, there's a little bit of hot glue on the uh, power LED there. So I have no problems using a little more hot glue to hold that power switch in. Got to use a spudger to hold it in place because it's hot glue after all. I want to burn myself. All right, how's it work now? Oh yeah, I don't think that's going anywhere. Power LED is staying put too. And in case you're curious, the uh, hard drive activity LED is just glued into the front panel. So I don't feel too bad about using hot glue. It's kind of a time honored tradition in late 90s PC building, just glue stuff in to keep it from like rattling loose during shipping. Unfortunately, I don't have the original monitor that would have gone with this. Apparently these were sold with your choice of a translucent CRT. Although I think later on in their life, they also had a color matched LCD that you could get. This is just going to have to do, um, that obviously doesn't match this, but look at how close of a color match these two are. You can tell where this thing got its inspiration. Anyway, if you want to know more about this particular monitor, stay tuned. We'll get to it at some point in the future, but I've got this all set up. Uh, there's no PS2 ports on this computer. And I don't have the original keyboard and mouse that would have gone with it, so we're just going to have to rock some generic USB ones. Um, but let's just fire it up and see if it actually works. Cross fingers. Oh, interesting. It's got a splash screen. I wonder if you can get into the BIOS. Seems like it's going through and like checking things. Okay, so... The hard drive's probably wiped, which is not surprising and really no big deal. Um, I want to see how to get into the BIOS on this thing. Okay, so apparently Fujitsu Siemens, <laughs> the innuendo in this video, um, sold this computer as well. Why? I don't know. But they called it the Selvin? which is a little difficult to do searching for because apparently Fujitsu also sold like NAS devices under that same name. So, okay, whatever. But I managed to find their tech spec page on this computer over on the Internet Archive. And apparently the way to get into the BIOS setup on this computer during boot is Control-Alt-Escape. Can't say I've ever heard of a key combo like that to get into the BIOS, and why they couldn't show that during the splash screen, I don't know, probably just to keep regular home computer buyers from going in and goofing with the settings, but let's give that a shot. There we go. 
Wish this computer wasn't so loud. All right. Um, just kind of your typical bio setup, it looks like. Quiet post is probably what turns on or off that splash screen. Although, honestly, I think that splash screen is kind of part of the charm. So since we know how to get in, we'll, we'll leave it. Uh, the boot sequence is pretty obvious because, uh, well, all you've got is CD-ROM drive and the hard drive. You do get a decent number of settings in here that you can play with, which is interesting. They didn't trim down the BIOS options. I've seen on some, you know, more kind of like inexpensive home use computers back during that time that they would actually cut out a lot of the BIOS options so that even if you could get in, you couldn't really screw with stuff too much. I think they just figured like the whole security by obscurity thing with the weird key sequence to get into the BIOS was probably good enough, I guess. We know the hard drive's blank, so let's just go in and try to get like Windows 98 put back on here or something. Okay, I really hope the optical drive works in this thing because I don't think the computer is capable of booting from USB. And if this drive is dead, I'm not sure where I would get a replacement one or parts because it's kind of this weird proprietary like front loading thing. Let's see what we get. It's spinning. It's not reading it. Wait a minute, is... Oh, I just remembered, I don't think any of my Windows 98 discs are actually bootable on their own. I think you need a boot floppy. Crap. Screw it, we're installing Windows Millennium Edition, AKA Windows Me. Why? Two reasons. One, I actually don't think it's that bad. And two, there's a small number of people that whenever Windows ME or ME, you can actually say both, believe me, I looked it up, um, comes up like at all in conversation, they just lose their minds. And I have no idea why, and they just need to let that go because this OS actually wasn't that bad. So I'm gonna put it on here. You can call it trolling if you want, I don't care. Yeah, so the hard drive's blank, okay. Well, that's kind of a cursed look, isn't it? Apple monitor, Windows me. Anyway, um, here's something that I'm discovering is kind of potentially a problem. It's a USB mouse, right? Because there's only USB ports, but um, at least in setup, there's no drivers for it. The keyboard works, but I can't move the mouse at all. I'm hoping that's something that gets fixed when the OS is done installing. Windows Me is supposed to have better USB support than 98 SE did anyway, so let's cross fingers that I don't have to do some sort of really weird hacks to try and get a mouse working on this thing. All right, the mouse works. Uh, here we go, let's see what drivers we're missing. Hopefully not too many. All right. Network, audio, and probably, yep, video as well. That's actually not too bad. Doesn't seem like it's missing any chipset drivers. And it sees, obviously, the USB controller because the mouse works. All right, off, uh, off to the internet. See if I can find these drivers. See, so yeah, this is why I go with Windows ME because uh, I just plugged a USB flash drive in and it, it just works. I, I know you can get it working under 98, but it's just, ME was a lot better dealing with USB stuff. Although I just noticed, why in the hell is this thing reporting a five and a quarter inch floppy drive? So Biostar doesn't have any drivers for this motherboard on its site anymore. It's just too old, they cut off that era of computing. However, this thing relies on a chipset from SIS. And surprisingly enough, SIS still has drivers for a lot of its older stuff out there. In fact, at least on the site that I found that seems to be their official downloads, it like tops out at Windows 7 for drivers. So lots of stuff for like 95, 98 ME, that sort of thing. The problem is I don't know what specific hardware is in here. There's not a ton of detail about like what exact model of audio and networking and all that is in here. So I'm just going to kind of shotgun a whole bunch of different drivers at this thing and hope that it works. For some of them, they didn't have Windows ME specific drivers, but in my experience, Windows 98 drivers usually work just fine as well. 
Well, it looks like I hit the jackpot on at least one of them. Running through one of these installs and now the Windows new hardware wizard popped up, so it found the sound card. Hopefully I can find video drivers too. So this is interesting. I'm back in the BIOS because that floppy drive, like, just annoys me, right? Seeing that in Windows, it doesn't have one. But there doesn't seem to be any way to actually disable the floppy drive controller that doesn't exist. Like, this motherboard literally doesn't have a floppy drive connector on it. I mean, it's probably got a controller, like, built into the chipset, but there's no way to turn it off. This is all just IDE stuff. Although, whoa, what's going on here? Oh, geez, that's not right. Everything else looks fine. 3.3 .3 is almost spot on. 5 volts, a little high, no big deal. 12 volts is just barely 9? What the heck? I know the power supply I'm using is capable of outputting a solid 12 volts, so I wonder if that isn't like failing power regulators or something. I had, I was afraid that potentially someone who had this machine before I got it had plugged in maybe the wrong power supply, right? I mean, we had to pin it out and it turns out it was backwards of the, of the power supply I dug out. So if someone else had tried another power brick that was wired the same way mine was originally, that could have caused some damage. And I kind of wonder if that isn't what's going on here. I didn't see anything visually wrong with the capacitors on the motherboard. I mean, that could still possibly be related, but if it was a cap problem, I would expect a lot of the other caps to have failed around the same time, so we'd be seeing weird voltages on the other rails too. It's just plus 12 volts that's sagging. I'm kind of surprised this machine's even still running. I realized leaving it like that just isn't going to sit well with a lot of people, so okay fine, I went and replaced some of the capacitors in the area of the board where there are voltage regulators. I didn't find anything visually wrong with the caps that I pulled out. No signs of leakage, they were clean, but sure enough, after I powered the machine back on, replacing those did seem to have a bit of a difference. We're a lot closer to 12 volts now than we were before, but still not quite there. So it makes me suspect that there's still something else kind of wrong with this motherboard. Though to be honest, seeing hardware problems with a machine like this uh, doesn't really surprise me. I mean, these things were sold for 500 bucks when they were brand new, and that was a really cut rate price for a brand new computer in 1999. The industry had to figure out how to make PCs cheap really quick, especially with the whole internet era kicking off in earnest. That was this thing's entire purpose. Would this machine be good for gaming? No, absolutely not. It's just built in like basic video, basic sound. This was really just an internet appliance, right? Just something to get you online with the ISP of your choice. So it doesn't surprise me at all that perhaps they may have used inexpensive or like, you know, lower quality components inside. I mean, corners were definitely cut on this thing when it was made, and I'm not really surprised that it might be struggling now, even if things like caps aren't actually the root cause of its problems. So yeah, it doesn't report it here, but I found that this machine is actually a 450 megahertz uh, K6 series CPU. It's reporting 124 megabytes of memory because it's got a 128 meg stick in the RAM slot, but four megs are stolen for the onboard integrated video. Um, yeah, this thing is not a gaming PC whatsoever. And honestly, that's probably okay because as much as I hate to say it, like, we saw when we took the thing apart just all the corners they had to cut to get this thing down to that price. And integrated graphics with no ability to upgrade or expand just didn't do this thing any favors. You didn't buy one of these to play games on it. Now, arguably, you probably didn't buy one of these to even use as your like main PC unless all you cared about was getting on the internet. 
because that's really all this thing was designed to do. It's got the built-in modem, it's got built-in networking. Broadband in the late 90s was becoming more available to households, at least here in the US. I know some places around the world got access to cable and DSL earlier into the 90s than we did here, but I remember fondly this era of not just the aesthetics, the translucent plastic, even though some people think it's trashy, I love it, but also that feeling of just rapid progress, not just in terms of the hardware, but also the connectivity, you know, being able to get faster and faster dial up and then finally being able to get DSL at home where the internet is always on. That was mind blowing. And that was mind blowing for a lot of other people and families as well. Maybe they needed to pick up a second computer because just having the one PC in the living room no longer cut it for them anymore. People would be fighting over it. Maybe the kids needed to use a computer for homework while the parents wanted to surf the internet or something like that. So cheap PCs like this, as much as they kind of sucked, they still did serve a purpose. Sometimes you stumble across a retro computer and it helps you remember fondly that era, assuming you lived through it, because maybe using it now is just as good as you remember it being way back when. But sometimes you also run across machines that remind you of some of the um, less fond parts of living through a prior era. And all you can do is just laugh at how far we've really come. Anyway, if you like the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.